Good morning, good morning. Hello? There we go. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to call the January 25th, 2019 board meeting of Santa Cruz Metro uh, Board of Directors to order. Um, the, uh, we are waiting, uh, we have been notified that Judge Paul Burdick will not be here until, oh, probably uh, 9.30 or quarter two, so we're going to, and we do have a quorum without having the new members sworn in, so we're going to go ahead and have the roll call and, and follow the, the agenda until uh, Judge Burdick comes in. Uh, so if we would call, uh, have the roll call, please. Okay. So I'm sorry, I have a technical question, Julie, should I call even those that aren't sworn in yet? Just go ahead and call them so we can just get it on the record who's okay. here. Director Baltor. Here. Director Myers. Here. Director Kaufman Gomez. Present. Director Gonzalez. Here. Director Leopold. Here. Director Lynn. Here. Director Matthews. Matthews. Okay. She's here. Matthews. Yes. In conversation. <laughs> We had her sit next to the lawyer, but she's still going to get into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Separate those. Two. Yeah. Director McPherson. Here. Director Rothwell. He's not going to be here today. Yeah. Director Preston. Ex officio Director Preston. Ex officio Director Northcott. Here. Good. Welcome. We Welcome. Thank you. Uh, a couple of announcements uh, that I didn't call or not call. Pardon me? Director Rothwell, I'm sorry. I'm here. Oh, I thought <laughs> she did. I skipped right over here. Oh, right. Did you see uh, Mike and leading the uh, the symphony the, uh, about a month ago in the Sentinel? I swear it was a look alike like I have never seen before. Wasn't <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, okay, I would like to make a couple of announcements. Uh, Carlos Landaveri will be available for Spanish interpretation. Uh, Carlos, if you'd like to please come up and just tell them who you are and which you, if they need any help, if anybody needs any help here. Good morning, Buenos dias. Carlos Landaveri, your interpreter. Para las personas que prefieren español, voy a estar en la parte de atrás. Thank you. Gracias. Also, that the meeting is being televised by Community Television of Santa Cruz, and our technician is Mr. Lynn Dutton. Um, the. Um, I think we'll go ahead with the uh, resolutions of. Uh, some of the board members. Um, uh, we're going to turn this over to uh, Mr. Clifford, our CEO. Okay, uh, so we have here with us today uh, Norm Hagen, who is retired from the board, and I believe his wife is here with him too today. And just a couple of quick nuggets uh, um, about Norm's history here. Um, between 2000 and 2004, he was a member of the Mastiff, M-A-S-T-F, advisory group. We no longer have that. Uh, don't, please don't ask me what that stands for, but Norm surely knows. They <laughs> don't. Um, here at Metro Transit. Uh, then in uh, 2004 to 2005, he was appointed to the uh, original MAC, that's the Metro Advisory Committee. Um, and then in 2005 through 2012, he was elected to the Metro Board of Directors. 2010 through 2012, he was also uh, representative on the Regional Transportation Commission, RTC. 2013, he was reappointed to the MAC. And then in 2014, he was appointed to the ENDTAC uh, Committee. And then in May of 2015, reappointed to the Metro Board. So Norm has had a long standing uh, tenure with this board in various capacities and has done wonderful things from what I hear predate me and certainly what I've witnessed since I've been aboard in 2014. I'd like to add to that uh, as the one who nominated Norm for his second go around, so to speak. This is uh, really what you would call a scholar because he's a former teacher and certainly a gentleman. Uh, he has been always kind and courteous to everybody he contacts. He is one more than any of us in the, on the, any board that I know of that uses the bus d daily, for the, I think, every day. And so uh, he is a, a true um, a true trooper for 
the Santa Cruz Metro, and I can't say enough about him. Uh, his input has been really very, very much needed, and uh, we highly respect what you have done for this district. And, uh, you know, your wife is, I hope she, she really wants you to come home again, but I don't know. <laughs> You're on that bus a long time, you know, but anyway. But uh, I want to thank her, too, for allowing you to be a representative for us uh, on this board. It's been very much appreciated. And uh, we wish you well in, uh, well, I don't know if it's any kind of retirement. You'll be doing something. But, uh, <laughs> so I just want to say that for Norm. It's terrific. And after some comments, I'll come down to present a, a, a plaque for you, and then you can make some comments. Yes, Mr. Rockman. I, I also want to say, I also want to say that I, I've served with Norm uh, many years now on this board, and uh, he's been a staunch advocate for the disabled in this community. and. We've had at times problems with our paratransit system, and thankfully not so many now as we were having before. When that was happening, he was on the case about those issues and made sure that the board was aware of those problems and addressed them. He's also been someone who I think generally has uh, tried to help the general public uh, understand how critical this service is for many people in our community. So I, I think it's really been valuable to have him on this board. He's made a real difference for the community as a whole. So I want to thank him for his years of service. Here, Thank here. you. And I, I see a lot of red buttons. If, you're, if they're on and you're not going to speak, please just push the button and uh, turn them off. Um, but uh, we do, uh, if you do, would like to say something, it's uh, 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 Director Matthews. I have not served, I think I'm on the yeah. norm for many, many years, but I have the same feeling of gratitude for everything you've taught. Certainly your dedication and effectiveness as an advocate, but equally, the goodwill and the positive feelings you've had towards others, there's never been a time when we needed that more here. And that's been so constructive. So I want to thank you both for your advocacy and for your wonderful personal, personal style. Thank you. Scott and Gomez. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, Norm, uh, as well, uh, being a community member, I know how active you've been. Um, we've really appreciated all of the time and effort you've put into this. We also know uh, how long it takes to get here, and that kind of devotion, dedication from Watsonville to be that advocate um, has been remarkable because we need to make sure that we have that South County representation. Not only do you provide that with the balance for us, but also um, representing uh, the community of those that, that have the disabilities that need this service, and um, we have a lot of respect. I hope that we'll still continue to see you in our chambers in Watsonville for other activity in the future here. So. Thank you very much for all of the time and service and dedication you have. There's a few more that want to say something. Director Lynn? Yeah, it's Norm's one of the first people I met when I joined the board, and no one <coughs> made me feel more welcome. And um, it just, just felt like we just developed a, a friendship right from the start. And I, too, appreciate that you were even um, up in Scotts Valley for the press conference, and which is even further commute. And uh, the input that you provide a balance, even sometimes when when there have been complaints on Metro, we've said, nope, that one actually isn't an issue, but this area is. So, you know, we will miss that input, but I'm sure you'll still be here when you can, and, and we hope to see you. So, at all of these that laugh at uh, RTC and Metro <coughs> and throughout the community, so thank you. Director Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Norm, uh, you've, uh, you have a great skill uh, in, from your years of teaching. Uh, not only could you identify former students who have come to testify at different times or have served on this board, uh, but uh, you, uh, in, as a, you must have been a great teacher because you've never spoken down to, to anybody here. You know, you know, you have a lot of information. Uh, you, uh, you've really appreciated the input that people have given. So I know you, you must be a great teacher because to, to make people feel a, as though they're heard, um, that you care about what they have to say, and that you've always extended a hand of friendship. You and I have developed a friendship uh, in serving together. So I, I really appreciate that, and uh, I'll miss serving with you here. Vice Chair Bachdorf. 
Norm, my, my dad's name was Norm, so I knew I liked you the minute I met you, so that, that, that was easy. Uh, you know, you, you've always been an advocate for the public. Uh, you, you bring that to the table every time you come, and you've definitely been a role model for the use of public transportation. And I think the thing I'm going to miss the most is you always provide a little calming effect for the room, which is, uh, is greatly needed here sometimes. So thank you. We're going to miss you. I'd like to present this to Norm Hagen, and uh, if you could like, please say a few words. <clears throat> Come on over here. You could. This won't take more than 20 or 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we have three minute time limit. <laughs> uh, Norm, on behalf of the Santa Cruz uh, Metro, we want to present you with this for uh, outstanding service, dedicated service, and friendly service. To everybody on this board and anybody who used the transit o operation that we have here in Santa Cruz County. Thank you very much. And as much as I love Metro, and for what it's given to me, my wife loves you even more. <laughs> another time, she didn't have to drag me around. She appreciates that. But I will miss this board, this function. It really means a lot to me. It means a lot to the people in our community, too. And all I can say is thank you. Two very minor little words, but they mean so much to me in my relationship with you folks, each and every one of you. And the new members, you didn't have to put up with me. <laughs> God bless you all. And next time I show up, I will be a member for the community. <laughs> and I will tell you exactly what you should do. You get three minutes. <laughs> I'd also like to announce that uh, we will have resolutions uh, for those uh, members who are not going or leaving the board, uh, Jimmy Dutra from Watsonville and Cynthia Chase from Santa Cruz. We will make those presentations uh, when they're <coughs> present. Uh, but we appreciate their service and just want them to know that uh, very clearly as well. Uh, so if we can uh, move on. Uh, pardon me? Can I have a motion to approve the resolution? Oh, excuse me. Second. Motion and a second to approve the three resolutions. <coughs> yes. Who was the mover? Thank you. Did you have a comment? No, okay, okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered. Okay. Uh, now we go to uh, item number six, Board of Directors comments. Any Board of Director have comments of items that are not on the agenda? Oh, uh, Trent, this is uh, Kaufman Gomez. Thank you. I, I want to let the, um, the board know that I went to the TAMSI meeting over in Monterey County, and uh, they've got an ad campaign, they have a campaign that they're doing with uh, a navigator, a volunteer navigator on their bus system, and that helps to educate other writers and to encourage writership and to uh, teach them what writing a uh, bus is about and also uh, bus etiquette. And uh, so there was somebody that was uh, provided an award uh, for that, and this information is being shared with Alex on what that program is about with Hansi that might be helpful for us to have that kind of a volunteer relationship on um, maybe encouraging a bit more ridership and maybe groups to do it, maybe field trips, that kind of thing. 
And um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is Watsonville has adopted a traffic safety action plan that is to go along with the Vision Zero. And we're really emphasizing on safety zones, zero tolerance on that, um, working on enhancements and whatnot. And we're thinking that uh, the buses, and let, if, we, if we have no ads on the buses, maybe we can be putting some of the safety component ads just generically on the buses of, you know, watch out for pedestrians, you know, safe driving kind of thing. So maybe if we have blank space and we're not selling those ad spaces, that maybe we could do something like that with adding safety um, announcements on our buses. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Very well. uh, Director Rockton. I just want to point out to the directors, it takes three seconds for these mics to warm up. So when you turn, if you, before you're going to speak, do it three <coughs> seconds early or wait three seconds early. <laughs> we missed the beginning of your comments. I'm sorry. Uh, any other um, members have comments? I have one, just uh, the recent uh, Regional Transportation Commission meeting. I think it's important to recognize that the Regional Transportation Commission took uh, an important unanimous vote about a cooperative effort like uh, unlike I've seen in many years, uh, and moving ahead, uh, how we can work with the RTC in a better fashion. Uh, we have a new CEO, at, uh, and some of us uh, on this board do serve on the RTC. Uh, Mr. Clifford and Mr. Preston, the new CEO of, of the RTC, uh, have both, uh, have, they've gotten together, and I think that uh, on non numerous occasions, and I think uh, we're, we're in for a real bright future in a cooperative effort. Uh, and it really fits well because going back to the Measure D when so many, every facet of transportation was included in that measure that was passed by more than two-thirds of the voters in November of 2016, every facet of transportation was in there and uh, it's pretty well understood that every facet of transportation really needs to be addressed in this county for us to improve our transportation network in general. So uh, I just want, I think it's uh, very encouraging and uh, I, uh, I know that some of the, the, us who are on the RTC as well uh, feel very, uh, very confident that we're going to have a, a really bright future working together. Any other board comments? Okay. Um, we will go to the public for any uh, communications on <laughs> items that are not on today's agenda. Is there anybody who would like to speak to us? and introduce myself. I'm the newly elected general chairperson for uh, Smart Transportation Local 23, James Sandoval. And uh, we pretty much got a new team here too. They're all here and present. And um, we represent the drivers and paracruisers at Metro. And uh, we're here and we're excited to work with you guys to try to improve transportation in this county. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. And I want to say too uh, that um, we really appreciate the drivers when we were in some real tight financial situations not too long ago. Uh, the drivers really stepped up and helped us out. We were much, very much appreciated, and that's not just because we're going into negotiations this year. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, truly felt. We've said it before, but we want to reiterate it uh, again. Thank you for uh, your recognition of the, the problem that we had, and we all had to do it as a team effort to uh, to address it, to keep the system running as well as we could. So thank you again. Uh, Ms. Matthews. Waiting like three seconds. Um, Mr. Sandoval, I don't, oh, I don't know, could sorry. you give us like, just couple sentences about your background who you are, just super, super. Sure. Uh, I've been at Metro for six years now, and uh, I've been a driver for all of that until this year. Um, I was born and raised in Watsonville, so, you know, been in here in this county my whole life, and it means a lot to me to try to improve the transportation here. And, good. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, I'm Brett Garrett from Santa Cruz, um, and just this week I was appointed to the Santa Cruz Downtown Commission. I'm happy to report that yesterday our commission voted to recommend increasing the, uh, the city's transportation demand management budget to fund a full EcoPass program for downtown employees. We want every downtown employee to receive a free Metro Pass, so I look forward to seeing this collaboration between the Metro and the city of Santa Cruz. I think it still needs a vote from you all, too, but I, I'm confident. Um, but I, the, the main reason I came this morning is to speak as an individual and as the new secretary of Santa Cruz PRT, Santa Cruz Personal Rapid Transit, regarding solutions for the rail corridor and indeed for the unified corridors connecting Watsonville to Santa Cruz. 
I deeply appreciate Metro's request for a comprehensive alternatives analysis to determine the best mode of transit for the rail corridor. Um, I strongly recommend for that analysis to include thinking outside the box, going beyond trains and buses, to also investigate developing technologies such as personal rapid transit. What makes PRT a superior transit system? Safety. An elevated system is completely separate from bikes, pedestrians, and cars. On demand, it's designed so that instead of people waiting for the bus, each station will often have pop cars waiting for people. Um, it's direct and convenient from any station to any station within the system. That means an easy trip from anywhere on Soquel Avenue to anywhere on the rail corridor. No transfers required if the system covers both. That means for many people, transit becomes more convenient than a car. And low operation costs, a big key. Once the system is installed, the, the fare box revenues could sustain the system, or with subsidies, we could offer free transit. Some companies, including TransitX, JPods, and SkyTran, expect to offer privately funded PRT systems that could be installed at no taxpayer cost. And PRT can easily coexist with freight trains. If we do this right, Metro can operate the system. The state wants us to electrify transit, and this is a great way to do it. I've long believed in PRT as a superior mode of transit, especially in a community like ours. But it's the climate crisis that pushed me over the edge from what a great idea, wouldn't that be cool, to thinking this is urgent. <coughs> the planet desperately needs PRT and similar solutions to attract more riders. Um, and also because pod cars would use substantially less energy per passenger than a train or a bus. It's an efficient system, can be designed with its own solar panels to generate enough electricity to run the system. Santa Cruz can be a great example for the rest of the state and the rest of the world. So Gina over there has copies for you of a report describing possible benefits of PRT for Santa Cruz County. Um, the comprehensive alternatives analysis will be a great opportunity to, to confirm the statements in that report. Um, please include PRT in the alternatives analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we'll look forward to getting that report from your downtown association. Thank you. Uh, any other, or commission? Um, any other, uh, any other comments from the public? Okay, we'll go to item number eight. Are there any uh, written communications from the MAC? Yes, sir. No written communications. Any labor number nine? Uh, any labor uh, organization communications? <coughs> I think we already had your say. <laughs> uh, number 10, additional uh, documentation to support the existing agenda items. Anything that's on the agenda? Uh, there is not. Okay. Okay, we will move to the consent agenda. Can I have a quick question? Yeah. Should I be voting on things before I'm sworn in this morning? Well, well, you were sworn in. in. Okay. okay. No, we're going to do your ceremonial. A ceremonial thing today. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. We will now move to the consent agenda, uh, items number 11. Oh, um, with one uh, change, uh, we are mo removing um, item number 20, oral update on contract options, from the consent agenda. That we're removing that. That's, that's, on, that's on the regular agenda. agenda. So the consent's oh, okay. Oh, excuse me. We'll just have to just move you it. Yeah. Thank you. This is my last day as chair, so <laughs> I'm trying to get out of here as fast as I can. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, okay, up to 11, uh, item number 1110. Uh, any, uh, any comments from the public on the consent agenda? Anybody from, yes, uh, just Matt. Is something being taken off the No, excuse me, nothing is being taken off the consent agenda. I'm sorry, yes. I move the consent agenda. Second. Move and second to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Now we go to the regular agenda. Uh, and before we get to item 12, uh, we're going to remove item 20. Uh, it'll come back next month to us. Um, so that'll be uh, removed from the agenda. But now we will uh, go with the presentation of employee longevity awards for, uh, I'm not sure who is here. So uh, the only ones that are here are in the that we're expecting, we're expecting to call them to Okay. Uh, we want to uh, present, I think they're up there, thank you. Yeah, yeah right there. Um, first of all, for the 15 years, uh, there's, there's um, what, four, three, four, Carolyn Bowers, Gustavo Cortez, and Bonnie Ferris are not here today, but we really want to thank them for their 15 years of service to Metro, but I believe who's here today is Todd Mitchell. 
He's not here either. Okay. Um, well, we would like to express our appreciation for their dedicated service for 15 years for Metro. Uh, for 10 years, Andrea, is it Use Gill? Use Gill. Yeah. Gill. And Eric Berg. You can see there one of them here. Eric Burke, come on up. <laughs> Ten years. Not a lot of public speaking in my job because I'm behind a desk all the time. But um, some jobs you can sleep at night, and uh, mine's one of them. So. <laughs> is always appreciated. <laughs> Can I add something, something to just, just about Eric that he's done? Is he, uh, sorry, Go ahead. Um, just, just recently this past summer we had a lot of struggles, you know, we've been understaffed, but Eric took it upon himself to be the sole scheduler for over a month. He worked every day because we didn't have anybody to cover that, and I just wanted to let you guys know the sacrifice that he made for Thank you very much. There's some adjustments to be made, and uh, I think it went as smoothly as we could, ever could have expected. So thank you for those comments. That's great. Uh, also, on uh, item number 13 now, employee retire resolutions for Juan Flores. I do not believe uh, he's here. John Vanderveer, six years. And Tom Hiltner, though, for 21 years. And I think Barrow has something to say. Inside joke there. Okay, all right. All right, I'll keep this brief, but I think it's important to acknowledge. I'd like to say a few words about Tom Hiltner, who spent the last 20 years giving his best to Santa Cruz Metro. As you can see from the short bio we provided you today on Tom, he's traveled an interesting path. From growing up in the Midwest, like myself and probably many people in California, to serving his country honorably riding nuclear submarines in the U.S. Navy, to college in Kent State, Ohio, his home state, to a master's degree at the University of Tennessee. Tom then made his way to California, first working down the road at MSD, and ultimately arriving at Santa Cruz Metro in 1998, along with a small child son, Victor, who just graduated from UC Berkeley. Proud dad. I'll get on to that part of the story. <laughs> During Tom's years at Metro, he's met his duties honorably, always making the extra effort, evenings, weekends, whatever it took. And you know, the grants world is tough and unforgiving. You work hours and hours to create good grant applications, and then watch as you don't always win, because the grants are oversubscribed generally 10 times the available funding. So you do all that work. Tom never whined or complained, he just went back to writing the next application. He has helped Alex and I strategize clever and novel approaches to grant applications in recent years in more trying and more limited funding environments. No more earmarks. In this context, I want to note that in the last 10 years alone, Tom has processed over 50 formula grants. You go, oh, well, we want them. $180 million worth of grants came in the door. They got to be processed. That's hours and hours and works. But more importantly, and the scorecard everybody keeps track of, competitive grants. In the last 10 years, Tom applied for 47 grants worth over $60 million. He won 26 of them worth over $20 million. That kind of batting average will get you in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> On a personal note, I want to thank Tom for helping myself and the planning department folks who are here succeed during these last three very difficult years. I and we couldn't have gotten through this challenging financial and workload time without his effort. <coughs> always, always willing to lend a hand and help where needed, and always with a smile and a good laugh. We wish Tom and his wife to it the best in their future endeavors, wherever they take them. Thanks again to Tom for all of Metro. Tom. <laughs> $20 million man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where he's going. <laughs> wow, thanks, Trio. I didn't expect that. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, it's good to be on the outside looking in. <laughs> I had a little regret on the 8th of January when I wasn't coming to work that last about five minutes. 
But um, if, if, if give me the opportunity, I'd like to make a few comments. Um, first of all, I want to express my appreciation to Obero for uh, what the last three years have been like since he's been here. He's, he's really uh, gone to bat for me a number of times, kind of throwing a fence up around the grants desk when it was necessary to uh, focus on grants and get that work done. And uh, it's been fun, you know, it's been a lot more fun than it had been in the in the earlier years, and it's good to go out with a smile on my face and some really fond memories of, of working here. And before I get into any other comments, I, I want to appreciate the uh, opportunity that I had to work here and make my contribution to transit. That's what I set out to do when I took my master's in 91. I wanted to you know, commit to improving public transit, and this has given me a place to do that. And Sometimes in the thick of things and the deadlines coming up, the endless cycle of you know, reporting and monitoring and project management tasks, compliance, bureaucracy, bureaucracy meetings, and all that, uh, it, it becomes, you know, uh, you just feel like a cog in a big machine that keeps rolling along and there's always uh, one more thing to do. Um, but I want to uh, express my appreciation to the, to the Metro staff who put up with my quirks and idiosyncrasies and, and those who endured the norm, numerous times, I'm sure, that I, I cycled them with the pressure that I felt coming up on deadlines and uh, people always came through often at the last minute with the sense of things that had to go in with the grant. and. Uh, you know, they, they stood up and stayed for the last minute to make sure that everything came together for a, a decent grant application, if not a win. And competitive grant applications are tough. As, as Barrow said, one in 10 got awarded. That's the obvious, they're oversubscribed, we've heard that, but there's, there's a few other curves that, that come. Every year, the emphasis areas change. One year, CNG buses are the latest technology to, the newest thing, and, and now it's uh, battery electric buses and fuel cell buses are the hot item. You know, sometimes it's shovel-ready infrastructure projects. Another year it's mobility management and specialized paratransit that you got to aim at. Um, and politics, you know, let's not forget, when the U.S. Department of Transportation is handing out money in this era, California is not the first name called to come up and take a grant. We got uh, one grant last year, 2018, out of the LONO program, State of California, 10% of the nation's population. We got about 5% of the awards in, in one grant. And uh, the BUILD project, with the BUILD program, which was much, much bigger, $1.5 billion, 70% of those grants went to rural areas the red states, names I never heard of, um, to build roads and stuff like that. Only about 30% of that money went to transit systems and, and desperately needed infrastructure. And 2018, uh, I submitted more competitive grant applications than another, uh, any other prior year. And as Alex's legislative uh, agenda for 2019 summarizes, uh, didn't hit any of them. And, and those were those are good grants, good grant applications. It's, you know, it's tough. You got to, like, like Barrow said, you got to step up to the plate and uh, swing for the fences every time and then uh, sit back and you might find out six months later whether you hit a base, uh, got a base hit or popped out. It's, you know, so there's, there's some frustration in that. And some of the formula grants take as much work. Uh, it takes a, a whole chain of bureaucracy to, to, to change taxes into transit trips. And there's a lot of reporting, monitoring. I think one of the most onerous applications is the Caltrans for one of the smallest grants that you get, which is $180,000 for operating assistance. Um, so, you know, it takes a book to get a few thousand, it takes an encyclopedia to get you know, three and a half million, five million, a lot of money. And, and sometimes, it's disappointing when projects that do get funded don't, don't progress. Uh, 
I came in the door in 1998. We were working with uh, Les White and Mark Dorfman to secure grant funding for Metro Base. And 20 years later, last month, tried to close out one of the grants in that project. And the last invoice hadn't been paid yet. It's still going on. Pacific Station, uh, year 2000, the first grant was secured from uh, Governor Gray Davis's Traffic Congestion Relief Fund. And uh, we all know where that's at. <laughs> Grants funded 13 new buses in the last four years. None of those have hit the road yet. Uh, but by virtue of the seat that you enabled me to occupy for these 20 years, I was able to make that contribution to transit. As, as Barrow put up there, it was you know, 200 and some million dollars that came across my desk in just the last 10 years. So we're, we're probably closer to half a billion over, over 20 years. And uh, it was really a great opportunity for me to monetize my, my writing skills, my, my bureaucratic experience, relationships with external agencies uh, that enabled me to make that contribution to public transit in Santa Cruz County. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy, I'm pleased that having sat through it day after day, sometimes it's hard to get that perspective of what really was accomplished, but um, that amount of money bought a lot of transit trips in Santa Cruz County. It took a lot of people to school, doctors, appointments, jobs. It paid benefits and, and wages for a lot of Metro employees and, and their families and myself included. It's, it's kind of rewarding to say I paid my way. Um, and it's only by virtue of the seat that I got to sit in that, that I was able to do that. And I appreciate Metro giving me that opportunity. Um, That doesn't even touch on some of the legislative stuff. You know, there was all the legislative stuff, but but really uh, the big accomplishment that everybody worked on, and that um, you know it was very fulfilling to work on for the last three years was getting SB one passed. That brought a lot of money for public transit into you know statewide, but it was a boon for Santa Cruz Metro. And then fighting the repeal effort the next year for another year. And both of those were successful, and that's a that's a good spot to be in in the last year of your, your career to see the money that the bill that you worked on for so long with you know, so many support letters, so many uh, legislative committee meetings, and uh, garnering support throughout the community uh, throughout the community, and to see that pass, and, and then to see it hold when there was a you know a fight to take it back down. Um, so that that's very so looking ahead, I, I anticipate great things coming out of the grants, uh, grants office and the planning department. I, I have to say in a scant three years, Barrow's created a, a, a well-respected, effective planning department that gets things done, and it's been a great pleasure to work for him. Uh, the new 10-year strategic plan is going to put uh, goals, objectives, budgets, schedules, and project management expertise behind the projects that Metro sorely needs to implement in the next few years to reorient its emphasis on transit services that are effective and efficient in, in reclaiming the ridership that's kind of ebbed away in the last few years. And on completing the physical plant that's necessary to support those services and grow the ridership over the next next few years. So I look forward to seeing that strategic plan come out. I know it's going to be uh, great. I've seen the one that we've done for San Mateo, and it's, it's a great piece of work. Um, the work that he's done to enable the, the grants legislative analysts to focus on, on what's important, funding Metro's core business, while developing uh, other procedures and processes to help other departments accomplish what's more appropriately within their purview. Um, during the transition period, and this also showed a lot of foresight to bring Juan to move in so that we had a two-month overlap, a two-month transition period, and we got to uh, just brainstorm about what was coming, talk a lot about urban planning theory, talk a lot about philosophy, and 
But those were some great conversations, very energizing. And, and, and at one point, I thought, wow, this is a great position. I wish I was going to want it. <laughs> but that's kind of the irony of it, that I have to step aside to, you know, to see the potential going forward that's going to come out of, out of this planning department. And Wandamu brings a tremendous set of skills to the, uh, to the grants desk. And, and I'm, I'm very optimistic what's going to happen with Metro going forward. Uh, so I, I just want to thank, uh, thank you for having had the opportunity. Uh, thank the staff for uh, working with me on, on some uh, tough projects over and over again. And uh, it's time for me to go. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much again. It's a terrific, uh, terrific legacy you're leaving. So uh, we're moving forward because of you, and we have very bright, uh, optimistic uh, thoughts in the future. So thank you again. Uh, we go to item number 14, the uh, oral report from our uh, CEO, Alex Clifford. Mr. Chair, directors, yes, a number of items to cover. As you alluded to earlier, the uh, RTC passed the uh, recommendations, modified recommendations of the Uniform Corridor Study. Um, we're very pleased about that. We had the opportunity, uh, as you pointed out, to partner with the new CEO at RTC over the holidays and, and talk about what our needs and concerns were on your behalf. And I hope you agree that the final outcome uh, resolution that was adopted by the RTC is, is good and represents what you took action on a couple of months back. Uh, in, as you sought to protect uh, bus funding in the future. Uh, as a result of all of that, we will be a, we'll have a seat at the table, we'll participate in the scope of the work for the alternatives analysis, and we'll participate in the process of evaluating the different mass transit modes that could occur in the railroad right-of-way, and maybe more important to us, identifying the actual costs of each of those, including our bus BRT concept that we put forth, and then, uh, equally important, how do you pay for it? And the how do you pay for it has always been important to us because if one or the other of those two uh, approaches or any other approach were to happen, um, it, we feel it important that the commission know today where that money would come from and if that money is coming from sources that Metro currently relies upon, that should be a part of the decision-making process. So all of that has been included in that resolution, and, and I'm very pleased about that outcome. And thank you all, board members, for your support on that. Moving on to the impact of the governmental shutdown, uh, you probably have seen a lot on TV lately about uh, MSD, our partners to the south in Monterey, uh, talking about the impacts of the government shutdown. <coughs> and they, they're a bit stressed on the cash flow side, and so they've gone very public about their concerns. Um, I, I have not been able to, in good conscience, pile on because our situation is actually a little bit different. Now, that could change if this goes on and on and on, but for right now, we are okay. Why, why in part are we okay? Um, you took a very important action in the last year to replenish your reserves, so you have reserves to protect us, uh, in it, which, which part of those reserves are intended for exactly that kind of thing whether it be state or federal, a disruption in cash flow, and we have some money in the bank to address that when that occurs. Um, but on our side, one of the largest items that we depend upon, the 5307 formula money, which is a little over $6 million, um, we have drawn that down. Uh, so we drew that down before the uh, uh, government shutdown occurred. And our next drawdown typically occurs somewhere between May and October. So there's a big span of time before we have to worry about that one uh, impacting us at, at this particular time. So it's a significant amount of money. If, if heaven forbid, the government still shut down in October, um, as October approaches, we'll be crying the blues, because that's nearly $7 million. Uh, in the nearest term, really, if we wanted to say, what is, what is the nearest term thing that could impact us? Um, if they're still shut down in September, that could create a complication because, uh, as you know from the other presentations, last year, Tom was successful in getting us a 5339B competitive grant 
in the amount of $1.2 million. That grant matched with the money that we put forth as a local match is going to buy uh, five compressed natural gas gillicks. Those are expected to be delivered, started to be delivered in August of this year. So come August, September, um, we'll be expected to pay our bills and we'll need that federal money to do that. So that's probably the short-term, near-term issue if the government shutdown continues is really uh, September for us. Our funding structure, too, is a bit different than MST of the South. They have a number of DOT contracts. Uh, and so they, they, where they provide service for the military, so their, their cash flow is dependent on that too. Uh, looking forward to, to the this year's 2019 funding of the FAST Act. As you know, we have this year and next year, and hopefully by the end of next year, there is a new FAST Act or a extended FAST Act in place. That's our federal funding um, that we depend on. The Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development, or what we sometimes refer to as the FUD, uh, recommended the FAST Act appropriations again this year be plussed up. And so remember last year we talked about plus up, which was FAST Act uh, mandated allocations in various programs and, and Congress and the President uh, voted to increase those over what the minimum thresholds were. And once again, the, the FUD is recommending that we get those plussed up, but not as much as last year, but still plussed up over the minimums, which is really kind of nice. Uh, in the bus and bus facilities program, that's a plus up of 160 million in the formula and, and the competitive, not for us, but nationwide, but of course our share will go up. Uh, in the low no, which as you know, we got a low no grant a number of years ago for three over the road electric <coughs> buses, that's being plus, proposed to be plus up $30 million. Um, the 5307 program is being increased by the FAST Act mandated 2% year over year, so no, no issues there. And then the build program, which we know as the old Tiger program, is actually going down as proposed from, from 1.5 billion to 900 million. That's the current stage of things. The build program, we haven't been able to win yet, but we do envision submitting grants under that program, potentially for um, Pacific, Pacific Station, potentially for a new Paragruz facility. Um, so we have an interest in that program. Um, and it also, uh, every year about this time, I talk to you about the year in review that we do with management and a number of our employees. So we call, soon after the new year, we call together our managers and we have them identify a couple of employees from their department to participate in the year review. And these are, these are employees, uh, ideally, that haven't participated in prior years in review, so they, they can come together. And it's our one time before, as we end a calendar year and before we start a new calendar year, to just take a moment to breathe and say, wow, we did a lot of things last year. Because as soon as January 1 rolls about, the first thing we're doing is talking about 100 things we want to do in 2019. And so we want to just take a breath and acknowledge the, the accomplishments <coughs> of the year, no accomplishments too, too small, is, is kind of the theme. And it starts off by all of those employees spending about 15 or 20 minutes uh, filling out an accomplishment that, that represents them or their group, their department. And they're all nice and neatly organized here on the wall on these sticky notes, but, but at the end of the exercise, they're all over the room. Um, and it's, it's just it's a chance to celebrate those many, many things not, that, that we don't often think about. But just the small things, paying invoices. How often do we think about that? Yet we function because we pay those invoices. Uh, so we capture all of that. Um, we kind of, uh, in advance of that, uh, fill, annually fill out the bulletin board with everything we can think of that's on our plate right now as we know it. And you have that in your packets uh, before you on your table, uh, barreled nice and neatly organized all of that chaos into your strategic priorities. So remember you had your work session, you created your strategic priorities, and Barrow went in and took all of those things, and that's not necessarily all inclusive, that's just... Uh, Barrow and I spending about uh, 15 minutes before the, the session to just try to capture everything we can think of that's on our plate right now and coming into the, the new year. Um, some things are carryovers from 2018 and some things will take multiple years to accomplish. And then we kind of wrap it up by letting everyone break into groups of five or six and they take a tripod and a large notepad and you see the, the six uh, large uh, notepad sheets around the room in which the employees go off as a group, and these are, these are uh, 
um, people representing all different departments getting together, and they, they look at what should be our top priorities. If they're the CEO, if they are the board, what would be the most important priorities for them? And so that is, that, that's represented on these six sheets of paper, and then we wrap that up. They each have six or seven dots. Um, they can have no more. They have to ration those out, and they go vote on what they think would be most important for them, uh, and then we have those, those represented. So maybe as you're leaving today, later today, you can take a look at that. Uh, if our employees were in charge, if they were the CEO, if they were the board, this is where they would put the focus in the coming year. Uh, and you have all that information uh, also in front of you. Um, this we're still working on because some themes are duplicates across different sheets and we want to consolidate them and we'll get those to you also. Uh, and then finally, in closing, uh, the, as, as was alluded to earlier, the, the city has been working through their TDM, their Transportation Demand Strategy, uh, which a component of that includes consideration of a bus pass, kind of an eco-pass type of a concept. Um, the, as you heard, the city commission uh, took the staff recommendation and added to that. Uh, I think staff recommendation was 94000 uh, out of a $300,000 TDM budget, and as a result of a commissioner recommendation, I think Zach Johnson put forth that it would be the 94000 plus another 217000 uh, to fund uh, an EcoPass program, which is basically the program that we submitted to the city for consideration. So as we understand that next, it's sometime in probably February, that will go to the city council and they'll consider that recommendation. Mr. Chair, that concludes my remarks. Okay, I, I just um, probably, I, I wanted to make a comment. I probably should have done this on item number six, the board of directors comment, but there was mention of SB1 and how important that is. And uh, it's, uh, the governor, uh, Newsom, announced his um, state of the state address, uh, some of the programs he wants. He really wants to target housing. Uh, but a concern for the, those of us involved in transportation is some of the ways he wants to go about to have the uh, local governments and the state meet its housing uh, demands that we are all facing throughout California. And uh, I can't remember the, the number, and that's just probably just as well, because my wife keeps telling me, just tell them what the subject matter is, don't give them the number. But it's a, a piece of legislation. You could repress, you could repress the number. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it, basically, it's, it's saying that uh, if uh, they, they want to encourage housing, as we all know that that's a pressing issue here, uh, but they uh, saying that if we don't meet or really make an earnest effort, I haven't read the exact legislation and how it's worded. The state is not meet, meeting its housing goal of 180,000 a year. It's less or just about half of that, 100,000, and we sure aren't what uh, AMBAG has for us and our, our numbers as well. Uh, but they're saying if you don't meet or really address your housing issues, we may cut your transportation funds from SB1. Uh, I, uh, this is something that local government, it, it was introduced last year, a similar piece of legislation. It was killed because of uh, county governments and local and city governments in, in particular fighting it. I know we're going to do that again because land use is a primary function of our local governments. And uh, independently, we can, we can plan our own communities in essence. But uh, it's a real concern if... Um, you know, if we, I don't know what these goals might be, but we have to keep our eye on it, and I, I know we will, but uh, it's something that was tried last year and didn't make it, and uh, it's going to be, it's on the agenda of one of those 2,000 bills that were introduced or will be introduced by the time bill introduction is uh, closed next month in February. Uh, it's something we need to keep our eye on, uh, because if we lose that, uh, we're, well, uh, we're back to where we were uh, pre SB1 and then Proposition 6 followed up, of course, and it failed uh, substantially as well. So, um, uh, Supervisor, or uh, Director Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I know we're going to be talking about our legislative agenda, and uh, I made a note uh, that when we talk about this, that we want to make sure to include that as part of our um, uh, goals for the year. Uh, I, too, agree with you um, that the, the Metro or any of our transportation systems shouldn't be held hostage. Uh, there's a lot of, what, we work very hard to pass this and we work very hard to ensure that it didn't get uh, uh, repealed. Um, <clears throat> it, we, it wasn't done on a conditional basis uh, and uh, this transit district has nothing to do with land use but we need to in, ensure that we, um, uh, we can move people around and 
it, even in our small little county, if some of us are doing our part, but others are doing our part, we still need to get those people moving around on those buses. So I think we should very strongly fight this, uh, not only at the, here at the Transit District, but at each of our councils and on the Board of Supervisors. Uh, Director Matthews, did you have a comment? I, sorry, okay, uh, Director Rocky. I just wanted to point out the irony of a situation where they have a housing crisis that forces people to live further away from where they're working, and then you punish that community by taking away their transportation money. That makes a lot of sense. <coughs> okay, I, uh, anybody have a board member would like to comment on this? Uh, uh, Mr. Clifford, you wanted to talk about new hires? Oh, yes, I neglected to mention that monthly I talk uh, briefly about new hires and promotions. We had uh, Courtney Martin, and Martin, new hired as a benefits administrator, Bernanke Caronco as a vehicle service worker, new hire, and Mike Montez as a new hire parts clerk. And then in the area of promotions, uh, we have this individual, we just, I don't think we've ever met him before, Eduardo Montesino, <laughs> <laughs> who promoted from a bus operator to a transit supervisor, and uh, Araceli, Rubio um, also promoted from a bus operator to a transit supervisor. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Matthews, I, Judge Burdick is here, so go ahead. But go ahead. We want to finish this. I think it's a, a quick question. We do talk uh, regularly about the difficulty in hiring in, in particular, as well as retention, but um, any progress on that? Hiring? Just the, difficulty the bus operators. Yes, so we, we uh, just More status, I guess. we just uh, graduated a class uh, this week of uh, bus operators, mm -hmm. and um, we're going to turn right back around. We still have vacancies, so we're going to turn right back around. Uh, we need to give our training instructor a little bit of a break, and then we'll turn back around and, and do another class. Um, we also have our VTT training that we have to keep up on, uh, along with. Uh, uh, training all the bus operators on the new equipment that we've, we've arrived, so it's a big job. And uh, we're going to be talking about that in the budget process also, but we are still short bus operators. Yeah. We're aggressively working on the paratransit side too. We have some folks that we're training, but we're still recruiting for more there. Just yeah. rough numerically the gap between what you have now and what you would want to be fully staffed. Uh, let's see, I'm going to ask Sarah, how many short bus operators right now? We should be able to have about 10. That would get us to a level that's so. 10 so, more. Yes, mm -hmm. so we need to recruit for that. And then Daniel over on the paratransit transit side. We, we have four new recruits. We're going to need three more operators. Mm -hmm. So 10 and three, kind of, or general. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, now we'll get back to uh, the, uh, the top of the agenda uh, to swear in new directors. Uh, Mike Rotkin, uh, county representative. Uh, Watsonville representative Aurelio Gonzalez. Well, pardon me? Yes, we, we'll probably go up to the mic after the swearing in and have the, uh, the, the members that are going to be sworn in on my right over here get you on TV. Uh, and uh, Cynthia Matthews as well. Well, actually, you know what? If you guys want to be on TV, we've got your backs to TV. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Well, Aurelio yeah. is right. Yeah, yeah. Stay there. You're stay perfect. there, Aurelio. Really. Yeah. Okay. And thank you, Judge Burdick, for uh, taking the time to come here. It's very much appreciated uh, for this important uh, body that we have to uh, serve the people of Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me. I'm uh, Judge Paul Burdick. I'm the presiding judge of the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. I'm happy to uh, do the honors of swearing the folks in who are <coughs> Some of you re-engaged, Mrs. Matthews, Mr. Rotkin. Mr. Rotkin was my uh, thesis advisor. I think you see that. Ms. Matthews, I don't know if you know it or not, but your daughter is my wife's I, yoga I, teacher. I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I managed to bump into the, uh, one of the fence posts out there when I was parking. Uh, so I damaged some property. I okay. <laughs> we'll see. It won't cost much. So, uh, we'll go ahead and jump right into your oath, which I was surprised to see uh, our, the identical oath that we all take as judicial officers. You're performing an important community service, and uh, 
what we'll have you do is just uh, say your names. I'm going to administer those to all of you at once. And so I, I, I do solemnly swear or affirm do solemnly solemnly swear swear or that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution, the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. That I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will faithfully discharge. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. The duties upon which I am about to enter. Congratulations. I now declare you. We just had, um, Director Rockton said students makes good, so thank you very much. You did, you've done well. Thank you for your service and taking the time to come here. It means a lot to us. I like to think we both have aged gracefully. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Well, one out of two ain't bad. <laughs> okay, we, we will move to uh, item number 15. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. There was one... Uh, Mr. Uh, before we get to number uh, 16, uh, Mr. Clifford would like to read something uh, in regard to Mr. Rotkin. Yeah, we, we thought with um, Mike's reappointment that um, it would be important to acknowledge a pretty incredible milestone, and that is 30 years of association with Santa Cruz Metro. Um, he joined the board shortly after the passage of the local ballot measure G, providing half-cent sales tax for public transit. This was one of the early local public transit uh, tax measures in a small community in the United States. Um, he walked over half of the precincts in the city of Santa Cruz in support of Measure G. He started when there was only about 50 diesel buses in the fleet. We might still have those here, actually. <laughs> he served on Metro as the city of Santa Cruz appointee of all of his six terms on the city council, and more recently appointed to uh, now his second term uh, as the county's public representative. He played a key role in making Santa Cruz Metro the first fully accessible bus fleet in the United States. He supported bringing pay and benefits for Metro drivers into the modern age before his joining uh, the board. Drivers might have uh, worked more than eight hour shifts uh, with, with large uh, spreads, uh, which would have made uh, work, work days as long as 16 hours with their splits uh, so he worked hard on that to change that. He supported affirmative action plans to diversify the district's management, administrative, and bus driving employees to reflect the gender and ethnic composition of the local community. He has served on every standing committee ever created by the Metro Board, uh, worked with all three of the district's general managers over the years and during several months of the transition between the first and second general manager as a board member and chair, he worked closely with Metro's general counsel and acting GM to oversee daily operations of the district. Uh, and maybe most importantly, he doesn't own a car. <laughs> <laughs> How about those pictures? Oh my God. <laughs> 30 years of service, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Chair, we, we need to pick up a, a, a motion on Mr. Hiltner's resolution. So moved. So moved. Uh, the resolution second. recognizes Mr. Hiltner. Second, moved and seconded. All those approved? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Okay, we will go now to now to the uh, uh, the, the uh, Oral uh, Metro Advisory Committee, the MAC semi-annual report. Michael Pisano. Hi, thank you, board, for having me here today and, and for bringing my last video as MAC chair. Um, first, I'd like to thank um, the staff, Alex, Vero, uh, Ciro, and especially Donna for keeping us on track in our, our uh, MAC meetings. And also, I'd like to uh, say, in my two years as chair and proceeding up to that, I'd like to thank those that have supported uh, overcoming our $6 million deficit, which is amazing. Uh, 
discussing measure D, SB1, the defeat of measure 6, also adding uh, ADL to our own buses and cameras. Um, and of course, Cereal's help on the 14 buses, which was amazing. Um, and then taking Santa Cruz for their jump bikes and the transportation demand management system. And like was mentioned earlier on the horizon, watching carefully the Governor Newsom's uh, new budget connecting housing and transportation, and then also our future census 2020. Um, and the last thing I like to mention is, or oh, one other thing is, the passions are code of conduct. I really appreciate that, and are uh, letting us add our voice, the Mac voice, to those comments and uh, taking those seriously, which is really nice. And we, um, Cassidy wanted me to ask if we can add. Um, Nice posters to the buses and maybe the, the transit um, stations uh, add a you know seals and dolphins and and, and that to the posters and make it really you know the most you know, just points about the code of conduct for people to, to understand and learn. And the last thing is if anybody can add their voice to bring to help bring Uber Pool and Lift Line to the county would be most appreciated. And, uh, thank you again. Very good. Is there any uh, director uh, comments to Michael? Uh, John. Uh, well, uh, um, I, I just want to express my appreciation to the MAC for their ongoing work uh, representing the, the riders and providing input to uh, this board and the administration of the Metro. I think it's really critical uh, for our, our, um, our service to be well represented by those who, who ride it. And I particularly want to express my appreciation to you because I know that you not only track what's going on here, but you track what's going on with the Regional Transportation Commission um, and always have good insight about things that we could be doing to make our transportation system better. So thank you for your work individually and thank you for the MAC collectively. Director Ruffin. I just wanted to add a comment that the work that you and your uh, board, your committee do, it's done kind of quietly behind the scenes, and you don't get a lot of praise, or people don't see the work you're doing. But those of us on the board that get your comments and then try and respond to them in a positive way, really appreciate what you're doing. And just to let you know that this work is not unseen by people that really have to make the final decisions about what's going on. So thank you so much for that work. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, it does not need a motion to. We move on to uh, item number 17 to approve the. Uh, or excuse me, 16th, the final revised Metro Base Phase 2 Operations Building Life of Project Budget and Project Completion. Uh, Mr. Clifford. Free at last. Can I ask, <laughs> ask Aaron to uh, talk a little bit about that and celebrate, celebrate the closure of a long project? I will try to keep it brief, but as Tom mentioned when he came in 1998, and he left, we're going to close it today. He's not going to witness it. Um, uh, he was uh, working on it. Um, the Metro Base project as a whole was a result of the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, which uh, destroyed our um, operations and maintenance in uh, Watsonville down in Sakata Lane, where we were. And, uh, the district had been splintered for many years. And Metro Base uh, was the concept of coming back and creating um, more of a campus to bring all of the elements of Metro back together. Um, so it's been a long time coming. Um, uh, again, 89, uh, we started planning Metro Base as a whole uh, around 99, 2000. Um, we engaged an architect in 2002 who designed all of these buildings. So it's the same uh, architect you can kind of see as you look at the buildings. Um, and uh, we accomplished various components of MetroBase um, since 2002 um, as funding came up. So when Alex came on board, we had completed um, the first phase, which is the fueling station across the street. That was completed in 2007. Uh, we, <clears throat> let's see, next we purchased this building and renovated it. We started the maintenance facility across the street. Um, this building was finished and we moved in in December of 2009. Uh, we finished the maintenance building in 2010. Um, and then we had a, a bit of a lull while we were looking for some more funding. And we uh, started the operations and bus yard across the street as the last phase. So when Alex came uh, and we were in that lull, um, he created the um, phase two portion of this to make it solely the operations 
facility and bus yard. So that's technically the, the phase two. Um, but you've been you've been looking at our budget. Um, we went out to bid. We started construction in 2013. Uh, the first phase of this LOP um, came in um, 2014, I believe. I have to look at my dates. Um, so you've seen sort of this LOP budget on this portion of the project since then. So I, I'm not going to go through the entire uh, staff report with you. This is the same staff report you've seen. We've had iterations of the budget throughout the years um, as the project has unfolded. Um, typically, we're adding funds. We were revising. Um, those were budgetary estimates at that time that we thought we needed to accomplish the line items that are in the attachment. And um, this report today is the final report, and it is now based on the um, final expenses. So uh, when Tom left in December, he's correct that final invoice was not paid, and it is now paid. So we're done. Uh, we're done. So these numbers are good. Um, I, I just want to, if I can bring your attention to the financial considerations, that's kind of um, um, where we're at today, a, a bit of a summary. So um, we started construction in 2013. Um, we ended up being almost a year uh, delayed in the project. We had um, a lot of problems come up. Um, we, we received occupancy from the city in March of 2016. So if you all recall, we moved in, in in March and started operating and got going and we got out of the temporary facility that we had been leasing over at Dubois. Um, we had leased a, a building. Um, two properties and our neighbor Union Carbide was gracious enough to allow us to use their property as sort of the pass through to all of that. Um, and we did uh, some improvements on their property to, to help out. Um, so, so we moved in. Um, I also wanted to mention that we did dedicate this building to Judy K. Souza. Um, Judy was a, a pioneer for women. She was the first bus operator here at Metro. Um, in the 70s, and uh, she was also the first uh, female transit supervisor, and then she became the first female uh, base superintendent, and um, she really led the way for, for a lot of women to get into this agency and, and, and do all of these things that typically had been uh, a male profession. So um, Judy did pass away while we were constructing the building, and so we, we dedicated it to, to build it uh, to her. and. Um, her family's still around, and they came and participated, and, and that's been really great. So, um, so thank you, Judy. <laughs> um, so we moved in in 2016. Um, we still had some ancillary projects. Um, part of the delay was a contractor. Part of it was the design. Uh, we made some changes. Um, so we, um, we, we went into that that not so fun world of claims and disputes with the contractor. Um, there were uh, things that were needed to be corrected, completed. Um, we did end up in arbitration and uh, had a settlement with that contractor. Um, our architect did contribute to that. Uh, those two items are in the budget, uh, the 1.6 million to the contractor and RNL. Um, this this kind of funny, this actually adjusts one dollar out of that line item because uh, they were supposed to send us 225000 towards the settlement and they sent us 224999 so I threw a dollar just to even <laughs> up there, you know. So, um, <laughs> so um, after that we were, you know, we were done with the, the contractor, um, we had some repairs to do, we had concrete repairs to uh, make it ADA accessible. We had to repaint the stairs. Um, we added um, pipe protection for a lot of the utility piping that was exposed in the garage and was subject to being hit by cars. Um, and we put some security fencing around the mechanical platform in the back, which is um, exposed to the elements and right up against the, the river and the fence back there. And we didn't want it to be vandalized. Um, so those are the, uh, the major things. I think the last thing was some um, property remediation from Dubois. Um, we did discover after we moved out that our diesel buses had been a little messy, so we had some cleanup activity to do. 
and um, the PTMISEA that you see going back or, or coming out of the project was uh, mostly from that. We anticipated we were going to have more expenses related to the remediation, and it came in it came in lower. So that was that was great. Um, so uh, the uh, we have a little bit of cash reserves left, a uh, thousand two one six. That will just go back into the cash reserves. Uh, we have uh, about eighteen thousand in Cal OES money, some security state security money that's been reallocated. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that will go to um, adding some security cameras at uh, the operations facility and at the fueling station. Um, upgrade that that system. And then the PTMI SEA portion, which is the bulk of it, um, will go back into the Pacific Station project, which is where we borrowed it from in the first place. So a little bit back to that project. Um, so all in all, the final expenses on phase two for the building and the yard were $29,069,687. So that was that's our final number, and that is uh, Phase two, that will close us out there. We do have a little bit of final reporting to do, as, and Tom's not here to help me, so I'm struggling through some reports right now, <laughs> but we'll, we're, we're getting there. So this, this is a big step um, and a, a big thing to get this done. So I have just a brief uh, presentation, a couple of slides to show you. Uh, this is the building. This is the Judy K. Souza Operations Facility. You can see in, on the front there. Um, this is just before we moved in. We had a local photographer, Neil Simmons, uh, come and do some beautiful photography. Um, it looks too good. It looks fake. It's too good to be true. <laughs> <laughs> it looks lovely. Um, and uh, Neil actually was friends with a local surfer who has a plane, and they check out the waves every morning. So. Uh, this, this photograph that's on the wall over here by the door, Neil took a, at dawn one morning when his friend was out checking out the surf. Um, so we, it's kind of dark and pink, that's because it's early morning. But uh, So that's a nice shot of our campus there. Um, uh, so that was nice to have him. And, and here's the shot. So you can see our administration building that you're in here on the left. Um, we gutted the building and remodeled it to what you see today. Uh, the fleet maintenance building there is our, our shop. Uh, we purchased some property. Um, Oddwalla was there. We had a, a few throughout the years. And then the back half, we had already had a maintenance facility on. So that was a nice new facility there. And then across the street, you can see Judy K. Souza. You can see our bus lot. Um, that was another reason we wanted to go in the morning, so we could get all the buses in the lot, as many as we could on a uh, Sunday morning. <laughs> And then the fueling and wash station over on the right. So that was our um, CNG facility that we, we built. We had a slow fill before, and now we also wash our bus buses there. So, um, so that's our, our new campus, and that's the, the completed picture there. Uh, the fueling and wash station, uh, these are just some of the final costs. Uh, can't, all told, it was about... Um, uh, 11 million after we added the second tank in 2013. Um, uh, this administration building was uh, 1.9, and uh, fleet maintenance was about 15.6, and that was two phases. So that second phase was 2010. Um, so that was great. And then all of those activities were completed in September of 2014. And that total budget, um, and that's just the construction budget, was was uh, 276, and that doesn't include all the environmental and the design. And um, all told, um, this phase and the second phase together uh, came to about 71 million. So that was a, a pretty big project for us to to accomplish here. Um, so the, again, this is just um, kind of what I had said earlier. We um, moved in in March. We did the dedication ceremony and ribbon cutting with Sam Farr, who <laughs> had helped us um, with quite a bit of the funding. When, back in the day when we had earmarks, um, he, he helped us quite a bit. Um, and there's a, a wonderful plaque on the front of the building um, naming some of the people who were instrumental in getting us uh, the, the funding and making this happen. Um, 
So there's the, the numbers that are in the staff report. Um, uh, at the end, we came in a little under and were able to um, refund some of the, the, the money. So that was great. And we are complete. Any questions? I, I just have one question. <coughs> What's the size of this campus? How many acres? So, oh, uh, the acres. So the um, J JKS and the fueling and wash is almost two acres back over there. So I don't have the total square footage on all three sites. Uh, the other, yes, Mr. Uh, Director Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, you know, in your retelling of the story, you're missing on the epic journey element. <laughs> I was trying to be brief. You know, it, it has, there are many great battles that were here. We, we lost friends along the way. Yes, we did. We had to fight for funding. Yeah. And we erected towers and everything. This is a Lord of the Rings uh, style. <laughs> Absolutely. Sound it would take so several volumes to really yeah. capture yeah. everything here. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's taken a lot of work. It was it was a vision that uh, that was uh, that the district had over 20 years ago. Um, it really makes sense for us uh, to have these uh, this, these facilities all together mm -hmm. and. Um, it took a lot of work uh, by, our, by our CEO um, uh, when he came in to, uh, to, to get it across the finish line with the help of a lot of staff members uh, because it wasn't in a good shape uh, then. Uh, that'll be book number 16, <laughs> probably 20 volumes. That was the great concrete delay. The concrete in delay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, even picking that contract, I remember, was that's 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 also part of the, the story. When, uh, when he pulled up in his red Ferrari out here, we went, hmm. <laughs> yeah, there there are villains in this, and there are there are heroes. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's pretty amazing. Uh, I I want to appreciate the work of all the staff members, both current and former, who worked on this. Uh, the uh, Mike, who's been here thirty years, maybe he's been around for most of it, but uh, uh, I've been only on the last ten years of this, uh, and it's been quite a journey. Uh, so I can express my appreciation, and uh, you know the. The metro based life of project budget might be dead, but long live metro base. <laughs> <laughs> Director Rockin? I just wanted to appreciate your particular contribution to this entire complex. Uh, someone who really kept on top of the numbers, the dollars, and how everything got managed financially, and who had no responsibility for all the problems, or that was there to make sure that they got fixed. So thank you for your work individually. Absolutely. Thank you, I was over there inspecting, and <laughs> you know, we, I do actually want to uh, say that um, Andy Kreck from Hill International, our project manager, came in and really turned the project around. And he was like a mentor. He was wonderful. He taught me so many things about uh, construction management and project management and really gave me the tools, uh, because he's been gone for two years now, uh, to see this thing through. So I uh, thank you, Andy. <laughs> yeah. I, was there a comment from the public that wanted to yeah. on, on, on your slide, you have the open in Twenty-one oh six. Oh, do I? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it felt like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for catching that. We'll fix that. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Thanks, Becky. Uh, any other comments from the board? I just want to say to the new and recent board members, you don't know what you've missed, and I'd be happy that you missed it. So it, uh, it's been a, a real struggle, uh, but we. We, we've succeeded in the end, and thank you very much, Aaron, for everything that you've done, and everybody in the staff who participated to make this come to an end. And yes. uh, we have some new beginnings that are going on, too. So we very much with confidence we're going to be able to do more in the future. Thank, thank you. you so much. They're, they're nice facilities. I think everybody's pretty happy working in them, and um, we're glad to, to move on to the next big project, which is electric buses and infrastructure. There we go. So wish yes, me luck. Yes, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. We will go to item number 17, uh, the uh, state and federal legislative agenda. Agenda, Mr. Clifford. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Directors, uh, I'll try to keep this brief. You have the report. It's similar to past years. 
I just take and go in and modify whatever uh, is no longer applicable out of the report and then whatever is moving this year into the report. So you do have that. If I go to the attachments, uh, the state and federal legislative agendas, uh, you can see that there are very sim similar themes in general in there. Uh, certainly uh, in February, the state uh, bi uh, the bills start being introduced in the state. So um, starting in March, we'll start keeping track of things that are introduced that could impact us. Um, what we do know is sort of a carryover from last year we have some uh, parts of our enabling legislation that we'd like to tweak a little bit. So we're carrying over the same recommendation from last year. We didn't get to this last year. We'd like the uh, board chair to appoint an ad hoc committee to meet with our general counsel and myself and talk about that. And if those items are uh, good to go, then we'll start talking to our state lobbyist about uh, introducing some legislation. So we'll be in touch on that. Um, Something really exciting for me is that uh, Senator Bell and Assemblyman Frazier have organized a TDA, Transportation Development Act, Reform Task Force. They determined that there are some problems with the current legislation, particularly the performance measures, and those performance measures have impacted uh, several properties in the state of California in a negative way, putting in jeopardy their TDA funding. Um, so I've been appointed as one of a handful of representatives across the state to sit on that task force and we start meeting in uh, Sacramento actually next week on that. It was a kickoff meeting. So I'll keep you informed as we go through that process. There are things that I've identified in the report that uh, certainly we want to look out for um, as possible changes to that legislation to make it more efficient and uh, hopefully to guarantee and more so secure the funding that this agency receives from TDA both on the STA, the State Transportation Assistance side, and on the LTF, the Local Transportation Funding side. Both of those come together to be TDA. On the federal side, uh, as you know, each year a group of board members and myself go to Washington, either in March or April. I'm proposing that we do that in April, probably early April. So Gina will be in touch to, uh, uh, with the chair to talk about who might go and to reach out to board members to see if they're available to go on that trip. I think we've taken as many as four board members, I want to say, on, on that uh, trip. Uh, it's really important for us because um, we, we time it away from the APTA legislative conference so that we're not walking the halls with thousands of other people. And what really benefits us is that because we separate ourselves from APTA, we're able each year so far, knock on wood, to get in and meet with the FTA administrator, which has always been uh, an important conversation for us. So we're seeking to do that again this year. And of course, on our agenda is the FAST Act is fastly approaching to have something done to it, either uh, extended or a new replacement put in place. And that is only two years away before it expires. It's time for Congress to start talking about that, because as we know, it probably takes them two years past the expiration before they adopt the new one. So we've got to get that started, and, and that brings up all of the usual discussions about how you fund a, a new uh, program and whether the monies are one-time monies or recurring monies. And of course, we would always argue they need to find recurring monies and take some of that burden off of our back. Uh, we will continue the journey about alternative fuels tax. Uh, we took a hit this year uh, in, in having to reduce that amount and going forward have a reduced amount because of the IRS's interpretation of how you calculate the fuel tax credit that we get for operating CNG buses. That hurt, but maybe more importantly going forward, as we move into this new mandate of electric buses, we'd like to see electric buses qualify for that alternative fuel tax. So what will happen is as we meet the mandate and, and eventually start buying more and more electric buses, we'll be retiring more and more compressed natural gas buses our alternative fuel tax credit will come down, uh, we'd like to get credit for the electric buses and have that uh, stay up there a little bit. Um, we're, we're also uh, advocating for a state of good repair program similar to the American Recovery and Relief Act back in 2009. And um, that initially proposal being put out by APTA and by the bus coalition is about $6.74 billion dollars um, so we would like to see an infrastructure program that's sort of separate from all the other plus-ups and things that we talked about. This is a one-time program that would fund all kinds of capital things, uh, much like ARA did back in 2009. So we hope that that will occur. 
Um, we're going to be very watchful as the census comes up in the next year because uh, we, we like what we have today. The census impacts uh, the urbanized areas. We have two <coughs> urbanized areas within our county, the Watsonville and the Santa Cruz, and there are benefits that come to, there's dollars that come to our agency by virtue of having two what they call UZA or urbanized areas as opposed to them being merged into one. Uh, ten years ago there was a play to do some merging and uh, thank you to, to Congressman Farr, that didn't happen. We need to be watchful that that play could be made again this coming time around. Uh, that could in impact us in the millions of dollars range if that were to occur. Um, so with that, uh, Mr. Chair, oh, I will add uh, Director Leopold's comment to the agenda about uh, being very watchful to oppose any linkage between uh, SB1 and housing. So we'll add that to the state legislature. Director Rockin. I, I don't think I've um, ever been accused of not being partisan enough, but I want to say on the federal on the issue of the federal legislation, I think our, our uh, legislative program is really important, and I'm not sure everybody really understands how important it is. Often these lists and other agencies are sort of wish lists of things that people might like to see in a perfect world. This is a list that we actually go to lobby on in a serious way in Washington, and we have a really good story to tell from this district in terms of what we do. And we're not going to go there to get, actually get help on our grants, which we've done directly almost every year. We, I'm sure every year we've gone, but um, for the for the country as a whole, um, because we don't go at the same time as everybody else in the American Public Transit Association, we have a an opportunity to actually not just listen to a speech from a public official, which is what happens on after weekend, but to actually um, meet and, and talk to, to uh, 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 senators and uh, House members of the House of Representatives, Congress members, and the um, it's really critical that on this that we be bipartisan. We, the, the success of getting refunded in 2020 and hopefully funding for more, which is going to be a struggle this year for sure requires that we not go there trying to sort of like push some particular partisan view of the way the world ought to operate, but really explain what it is that public transit needs to have happen in America. And um, so there are times when you wonder like, you know, when we have a need for more buses and people, why are we spending money to send <coughs> three or four people to five people to Washington, D.C.? It, it actually has helped this district very directly with funding and we need to get a bill, uh, and it won't happen if it doesn't start this spring in, in 2020, so we don't uh, end up defunding public transit in America, which is certainly on the uh, horizon as one of the possibilities that's out there. So I just wanted to speak up about the importance of this legislative agenda. It's, I think, properly pitched as, as trying to really figure out how we can appeal uh, not only to men, uh, members of Congress who come from urban areas that understand, obviously, how much they need public transit, but more rural areas and other places in the country, because that's where the votes are. and. Um, I think it's been successful in the past, and it's only kind of critical that we adopt this legislate this uh, program, and that we then go carry it out in a practical way, because it really matters to us in very in dollars and cents in the next you know five years. Thank you, Director Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. I appreciate uh, the the inclusion of the efforts to oppose uh, the new mandates on our SB one funds. Uh, after all the efforts we did to fight to get that money, um, I would be interested in serving on on the committee for the the. Uh, the authorizing legislation. Um, I think that would be Good. interesting. I'm going to put the time into that. Okay. Anybody else? Let me just know. Uh, we're going to be, you know, having some committee assignments and all. But I'd like to know your interest if you are interested in this aspect too. Uh, Director Matthews. Uh, yes, the legislative program is just so important. <laughs> it right. really does matter. Um, and I had some uh, time looking through the um, RTC legislative program, which is lengthy, it has a lot of these same issues in it. Um, one thing they mentioned there um, in the state legislative program is uh, supporting efforts to capture sales tax. So much of what we do is dependent on sales tax. So to the extent we, I mean, a lot of people care about that, but um, it should also be on our agenda as well. Um, okay. And then um, talking with our staff, uh, they brought up a possibility that I think could be very important to us and it has to do with um, uh, the, let me look on here, page four. Uh, and this occurs in the RTC. So it has to do with the definition of disadvantaged communities. 
the RTC legislative, state legislative agenda includes broadening the definition of disadvantaged communities in order to ensure that projects that benefit low income and other transportation disadvantaged residents are not excluded from funding, uh, uh, funding opportunities that support sustainable communities, transportation choices, and investments in alternative modes. And it was explained to me that there's a very strict definition statewide, but there is the possibility of doing a regionally defined definition, which can count for a critical few points when um, grants are being reviewed. And um, the RTC uh, does have a, uh, apparently, maybe those who serve on the RTC know more about this than I do, um, a, a definition that has been, uh, I think, referenced but not adopted, something like that. But it's, it's considered a legitimate regional definition. And where this can be important for us, and it references, again, other aspects of the um, uh, legislative agenda and work program, uh, looking for partners that can bring in new money. I'm thinking particularly of the uh, Pacific Station, where so much emphasis now, many people have referenced it already today, uh, the genuine interest priority on transportation linked development, and particularly the uh, uh, benefits of disadvantaged communities, and links with health facilities. We have on the table now, um, the possibility of doing something that links transportation, affordable housing, and uh, uh, affordable clinics, health clinics, uh, health and dental clinics. And the executive directors of those clinics are affordable housing providers uh, in this community. Say, that is money. That is the priority uh, for so many funding sources. So it should be, uh, I think we sh should do everything to position ourselves to bring in the, uh, those financial resources that will complement and complement efficiently Metro's interests. So I would just like to suggest that we include in our legislative agenda the addition of um, uh, the adding, uh, working for the alternative disadvantaged communities definition in sync with the RTC. Okay, well said, yes. Yes, sir. Well, I, I really appreciate uh, Director Matthews for bringing that up uh, because we have uh, failed to get some grants for the Watsonville Transit Center because only a portion of Watsonville is considered a disadvantaged community, not the entire community. And so we, were di we, we would, could not qualify for uh, the funds. And in fact, there's very few areas in, in the entire county that qualify under the strict uh, state right. definition. And downtown Santa Cruz has also been uh, uh, declared an enterprise zone. So there's just a whole lot of layering of things and, that and could it, be advantageous. And it can be a positive impact, obviously, on the sales tax, which you yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, no question about it. Mm -hmm. um, any other comments from board members? Any comments from the public? Okay. Uh, I'd entertain a motion. I move we adopt the uh, program with the two changes that have been pointed to. John, sorry. I move that we adopt the uh, the uh, proposed program of the changes proposed by uh, John Leopold and, and uh, supported by the CEO, the one that Cynthia just mentioned. Was, was there a third, or were those the two? Um, uh, I did reference also um, sales tax. The sales tax. Sales tax. Uh, those three yeah, changes. Sales tax to the greatest extent possible. So those were captured, but those those are the three changes right. to what's been proposed to us here. Okay, we have a motion to accept. Second. And uh, with the amendments, uh, motion by Lind, uh, second by Leopold. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. So ordered unanimously. Uh, item number 18 is the acceptance of the financial report uh, statements with independent auditors report for the year ended uh, uh, June 30th. I know that Angela's not here, but we have She's a not here. great feeling. Yeah. Well, I'll play Angela today. Um, I'm Debbie, I'm the finance deputy director. Um, and I just want to say, I am so glad the Odyssey is Metro-based. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That has sucked away my life here. <laughs> yes. um, I literally have spreadsheets, detailed invoices paid against that project that go back to 1998. It's thousands and thousands of lines. So I'm very happy that I can stop adding to that. So, but what I'm up here today for Yeah, turn that mic just toward you a little. There you go. Yeah, thank you. Okay. 
I don't like being that. Good. I know. <laughs> um, so we're asking the board today to formally accept the audited financial statements for last fiscal year, fiscal year 18. And um, I also wanted you to bring your, I wanted to bring your attention to the fact that we had to do a separate report this year, and that is for the uh, Measure D compliance. And it's not really an audit, it's just a compliance report. And we're required to do that um, because of our master funding agreement with the RTC. And that's on page 18D1. And then I was also asked to be brief because we have a lot on the agenda today. Um, so the high points of the, the audit this year are on page 18A71, if you want to flip there. So um, again, this year we received an unmodified opinion, and basically what that is is it's a clean bill of health. Um, we had um, the, the, our fed, I'm sorry, um, an un unmodified opinion for the financial statements and federal awards, and we're also considered a low risk oddity. So that's basically the best you can get. Um, I also want to bring your attention to the fact that we do still have two lingering um, agreed upon conditions and those are referenced in attachment C which is on page 18 C1 and those aren't current year conditions those are from the prior year and just very briefly um, the first condition is about reconciling our ticket stock and the second condition is about um, the current Paracruz pre-printed pre coupons that we um, issue to the Paracruz customers. And so we're working right now with um, GFI, who's our vendor for our ticket issuance machines, and they're supposed to be pushing through a software upgrade at the end of January that supposedly, and we're hoping against hope, that. Um, this is going to clear that issue for us and that the reports in the background will match our actual ticket sales. And thank you to Kayla, who's she, she stepped out, but um, she's been working diligently with the vendor to get this cleared. And then the second issue, um, we are going to discontinue the pre-printed Paracruise coupons and we're going to start issuing those through the same system that we use for the uh, fixed route coupons, and I'm sorry, the fixed route tickets. And that is estimated to be implemented March 1st. Yeah, so um, basically we got a great audit this year. We will be working towards clearing those too, hopefully, so everything will be clean. Um, and I want to thank the finance department because if they didn't work so diligently, um, we wouldn't continue to receive clean audits. And again, the agreed upon conditions, those aren't the same as a finding. So still this year, um, we have no findings. And um, and I also want to thank Lorraine, our accountant, because this was a particularly difficult year. We had uh, GASB um, implementation, we had the Measure D, we had a medical leave on the audit team. So um, she pulled it together. We were able to issue the report by the December 31st deadline and uh, we're good to go. Are there any questions? Any questions from the board? Uh, Director Matthews. Yeah, um, it, the audit report was very impressive. And I don't know how to read between the lines on the ticketing issues. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like that's been kind of a fraught challenge, to say the least. Yeah, I, I, no, I read correctly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the hope is that um, solutions are imminent. Yes. Confidence level? Um, <laughs> <laughs> non-financial opinion. My non-financial opinion. Um, we've been working at it. We've been making progress. Um, it just seems what happens is when they roll something out, there's unintended consequences. So everything was good before, and now suddenly there's something new that's a problem. But um, we've been working with them literally for a year. So I'm praying that this is going to go away. Yeah. Well, I guess there's more to this conversation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, and that's just in a few days they're rolling that out, so. Mm -hmm. it, maybe we could get reports on the progress of that. Sure. I, that. You know, you go so far down the line, and still, it sounds like it's the vendor. It's, it's the vendor, the it's not us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Frustrating. Yeah. yeah, but the other one will be cleared, yeah. so we'll be down to one, and then we'll keep beating on them to get this resolved. Okay.
Uh, any other comments? Uh, any comments from the public? We're not a faith-based community, but we all want to put our best thoughts into getting this uh, finalized. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. Oh, you have. Oh, excuse me. Let's see that. We can we just put clearly on the tickets that they're for prayer transit. They are. They're clearly identified, and it's in big print. Uh, 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 okay, that's good because I've had I've had problems with that in the past. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I move we accept I, the report. Second. Move and second it that we accept the report. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Now we will go to uh, item 19 to uh, authorizing the CEO to enter into a three-year license agreement with uh, Flixbus for accommodating the use of a stop twice per day at the Pacific Station Transit Center. Uh, Cyril, our COO. Morning. <laughs> Greetings to the new uh, directors. And, uh, Cyril Geary. Chief Operations Officer. I just wanted to introduce this topic as a, um, since last year, we've been uh, working with Flixbus to try to get uh, uh, a better understanding of how we can accommodate uh, a position for them at the Metro Center. Uh, they approached us with uh, a very unique and novel uh, service that they are offering, and we felt that uh, it was going to enhance uh, the opportunities and options that the residents of the community is going to have for other uh, transportation throughout uh, throughout the region. So, uh, with me, uh, I have Ty Costa and Nicholas Fiorio, and they'd like to give you just a, a brief overview of what the service is about and how it's going to play in with uh, our future. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having us uh, in your agenda. Um, we had a somewhat long presentation prepared, but uh, we're told we're a little time challenged, so I'm going to keep it short. Essentially, our company Flexbus was founded about six years ago in Germany by two college students who wanted to go on a skiing trip, and they couldn't get a bus out there. So uh, <laughs> they were very creative and created essentially what it is a uh, technological so uh, solutions for transportation. Uh, we partner with uh, local charter bus companies, and essentially they perform all of the routes that we plan, sell, and market. And they hire all the drivers and take care of all the bus operations. And we uh, take care of all the technological part of it. Uh, millennials love us because we put Wi-Fi's on the buses and uh, charging ports. Some of, some of them even have uh, virtual reality goggles. <laughs> um, and I guess the most important thing for us is that we want to create a culture that young people, as well as anybody who wants to take our services, uh, be able to get from point A to point B in long distance uh, trip with a bus, and then once they arrive at their final destination, use the local uh, public transit system. So it's good for your, for your ridership, and it's good for us to be able to bring people exactly where they want to be, and for that we're requesting just a space in your transit center so that we can do uh, daily pickups. So it's one pickup and drop off uh, each way on a line that goes from uh, Southern California all the way to Northern California. And these drop-offs last about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and do you, I think that's pretty much it. I'll open up for questions if you have any. Make it one of Go ahead. Excuse me, uh, Director Leopold. Uh, uh, this seems very interesting. What does it cost? So that's a great question. Uh, we have a pricing that is similar to airlines. It's dynamic. If you buy far enough in, a, in advance, it's fairly cheap. Uh, because we haven't started this line yet, I can't give you an exact price, but for example, if you buy a ticket from Los Angeles to Las Vegas, uh, three months in advance, you can pay $5 for it. Okay, so it's like a bulk bus that they have on the East Coast, similar? It's similar, but that's kind of like comparing a flip phone to a smartphone. Flip oh. bus is <laughs> Good answer. Yeah, right. Good answer. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Exceptional service, and uh, we're more dynamic. So, 
because we don't we don't buy our property for the bus stations, we come and we try to partner with uh, transit agencies. We're able to be in more desirable places for the passengers, so that they're exactly where they want to be. And um, all of our buses are three years or younger. We take safety very seriously. We actually follow the European standards of labor practices and driving hour requirements. So uh, I think we have a slide on that. Uh, but we require that they drive less hours than what the, the US federal government does. So. Thank you. Thank you. Director Rockton. You pointed out that this is good for your uh, organization and good for us, but it's really good for the climate uh, of, our, of our world as well. Because um, the, the single biggest example people use for why people need to have a private car is for the kinds of trips that you provide. Because you know, it's pretty easy to make an argument about why you might use the bus within a community, but how you get from LA to Las, Las Vegas or from here to Southern California or whatever. And um, the fact that you do it in a way that makes it really attractive for young people to use it means that maybe some of these folks will never get a car. They'll basically figure out how they can live their lives with public transit. And I think that's really, really critical. So I really enjoy the fact that we're uh, partnering with you to make this all happen. Okay. Director Matthews. Uh, this is just a classic example of transit influx here. <laughs> and are you requesting a dedicated, a single dedicated space or access to a space? Um, and I guess where I'm going with this for, um, for our staff is um, certainly there will be others coming along like this. And, um, you know, just how, how are we projecting um, expectations, just like the, the Google and, and Google buses, Facebook buses, took us by surprise. Basically, the service is uh, once in the AM, once in the PM. And just so whatever slots are available? We've identified a slot that's underutilized mm -hmm. on lane two, and it'll be similar to uh, the area where, just behind the uh, Yam track. 17 actually at the beginning. Uh, we, we've actually measured that space with an actual 45 foot bus previously, and it will accommodate that particular uh, bus. The, the schedule, and which I believe that was passed out, uh, so inbound, outbound, uh, gives the, the routing and the times that they'll be in Santa Cruz, so we should be able to work around that particular uh, time frame. For additional buses, I mean, we would have to have their schedules and things of that nature in order to try to uh, dynamically accommodate them mm -hmm. uh, around our schedule. And there's other options. I mean, there's Pacific Avenue, uh, the stop outside the Metro Center. But uh, what what I was envisioning was basically uh, having Flixbus come in, and there we have the amenities to service the people that would be waiting for the bus. And also making it convenient for people with uh, disabilities that be able to board the bus safely. And well, there's a security element there, so uh, people would be safe in that environment waiting for that for the bus. It's a new startup. Uh, it's basically something that's coming out from the East Coast and trying to establish their routes here. And uh, I think it's a good opportunity for us to have some options to, to get around. Peak is future. It looks like a little bit. Yeah. Um, and if, um, if the schedule doesn't work for any reason, we're always flexible and able to change the times to make sure there's no conflict with your agency. Thank you. Um, I, I have a few questions for you as well. <coughs> what would be your anticipation ridership for pickup or, or the, the route through Santa Cruz here? I mean, you're going to market. How many people do you think that you'll be receiving, you'll be seeing coming from our community? Uh, so, um, it's hard to say because we haven't started the line yet, but usually our lines, uh, they start with a bus that it's about 20% full, and eventually in a few months we are able to fill it up by 50 to 75%. Uh, some of our routes see even 100%, like LA to Vegas is the fullest route. Um, because there's so many uh, universities in this particular line, we stop at UCLA, we stop at USC, uh, and then uh, make a connection that is really uh, very easy for, for students in San Luis Obispo to also take the bus. And now here in Santa Cruz, we expect to have uh, the buses full in within six to seven months, hopefully. But it's hard to give you a, a, a number. And, yes. and you mentioned something about um, cross-promotional. What would be your vision of what that would look like? 
So one of the things that we provide is the ability to uh, somewhat market or advertise your services in exchange for the same kind of uh, proposal from you. So if you're able to you know, have signage on the station or maybe if you're willing to do ticket sales, we can offer you commission on the transit center if, if you're willing to do that or put brochures of your transit system on our buses and things like that. We have an entire department designated to cross promotion and marketing opportunities that is able to give you more detailed information. But essentially, we can cooperate so that we're helping each other sell. Um, so essentially, putting on your app what our bus routes would be at the time that you're um, arriving in our station, so that people that are riding your bus once they get off know what other buses and routes are available to them when they get there. I am unsure about the app because that's IT and I don't know how the integration goes to be honest. But we can definitely put up brochures of the routes on the buses so people that are coming here can just pick up and see all the lines that they can take. Uh, I can connect you with our marketing team who will be able to answer sure. these questions better. Thank you. Very good. And Director Gonzalez. I have, I have one question. Because you mentioned university, you stopped at UCLA. You're, you're starting up north. Are you starting at a university, or are you starting downtown San Francisco, or how north are you going or coming down? So uh, right now we stop at uh, Fifth and Townsend in San Francisco, right by the Caltrain station. Uh, we hope to be at the Salesforce Transit Center when they reopen, uh, and we're working with uh, UC Berkeley to open up um, a station there as well. Um, City Council is going to vote to approve us for the next couple months here, so eventually we'll have the, the UCs all connected. Director Myers. I just have a question about, it looks like a lot of these cities, are, are you making progress through most of these cities at this point in time, or where, where are you at with the sort of the overall route sort of map in terms of successfully negotiating with the jurisdictions? We have, I'd say 90% of the cities on that map. We're going to Utah. There might be time, well, Texas is not on the map, but we are also expanding to Texas and we're going to launch. We have to be all over the country within the next two years. But for that map specifically, we're, we're launching Utah in the next month or so. And aside from that, pretty much 99% of the cities are done. Thank you. Director Baca. Yeah, I, I think this is a great program, and, and I think that this gives us the true definition of what a transit facility should be used for. And what I really appreciate is that you're coming to us to be in a partner as opposed to some other agencies that just started using our facilities without our knowledge. So I, I look forward to us having a great relationship with you, and I wish your program success. Another question, uh, Director Matthews. Yeah, just because I didn't see it anywhere else, is this um, a use at no fee, or what, it, it just says... Um, for accommodating the use, just describe to me a little bit of what the content of the agreement will be. Between the the content of the agreement is basically per stop, so there's two stops, it's $11. Yeah. And it's, they'll be drilled uh, on a six month period. Okay, I just didn't see that here. Yeah, it's, it's, okay, oh, it's there, it's $11, okay. month per, or $11 per stop. Right? Per stop. Okay. 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 Yeah. Um, any it's questions? A three, uh, it's a three-year contract. Mm -hmm. Three-year contract, right. 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 Thank you. Agree with that. Any comments from the public? Per day. Per day. Per day. Okay. <laughs> Director Leopold. I, I just had one question. I put up the, uh, the website, and it showed a, a, a trip from San Diego to Los Angeles costing 99 cents. What would you have to do to get the 99 cents? <laughs> 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 uh, so that's a promotional, uh, <laughs> because we recently started that line, we start really low to get people on the bus, but it'll probably go up to $5 soon. So. Yeah, when I looked at it, uh, it, was, it was looking 5 to $10, depending on when you went. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, I think this is a, 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 a transit option that, uh, that especially our community, given the high number of students, uh, will use, and I would move the recommended actions. Okay. Second. Second. Uh, second, uh, Kaufman Gomez. Did you? Any, no more comments. Okay, we already went to the public. Uh, it's been moved that we accept this contract. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> so ordered unanimously. And thank you very much. A very exciting venture. Good luck. Addition thank you so much for your support. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, delayed num item number 20 to uh, next month. Uh, number 21, the 10-year fiscal.
2020-29 strategic business plan update. Uh, Vero Emerson, our planning and development director. All right, in the name of brevity, for me, I'm going to jump through this. October 17th, you had your initial board strategic business plan initial work session. And you and the management team established the seven strategic priorities that are in attachment A. Following on from that, the Metro management team has proposed a number of key tactical initiatives to support those seven priorities, attachment B. What we're asking you today is to approve and adopt those. These will allow the Metro staff to prioritize the use of our financial and staff resources. If pending your adoption today of these initiatives, we will go away and put together implementation multi-year or this year or whatever implementation plans and, and following on from that budget request for any of the initiatives that need funding to move this whole agenda forward. So I think I'm going to keep it pretty short to that point. This, the financial context will be our five-year budget plan and this is a living document so it's a ten-year plan but it will constantly be rolling forward. So why don't I keep it to that for the moment and answer any questions or let you take your action. Any uh, comments from the board? This? Uh, anybody from the public would like to address us on this issue? Number uh, I'm number 21. Uh, Director Leopold. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Uh, I appreciate all the work that's gone into this and, and thoughtfulness. There was there was one language use uh, or something I I didn't like as as much as the rest of it, uh, and that had the uh, two uh, F. It's not that I disagree with managing future labor costs or to maintain the capacity to provide uh, at least the current level of service. It, it would be nice to have something a little bit more supportive of our staff. You know we. We, uh, we have been working to uh, deal with some uh, long-term class and, uh, and compensation uh, issues, and it would be good to, for us to say, uh, 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 especially as, you know, in the other parts of this we deal with recruitment, to say that we should um, uh, uh, address our labor costs uh, so to be able to support our, our staff uh, to live in, in our community and, and provide the service at least at the level that we're at now. Uh, something more supportive of our, of our staff too, recognizing. Perfect. Let me play wordsmithing with that. Yeah. And then when we bring it back to the third and final step of the strategic plan where we offer up some budgets and implementation plans, I will have gotten you all sign up on better wording there. Thanks. Thanks. Something like work with or what? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Director Rutten. I just wanted to appreciate uh, you and your staff's ability to capture the, the uh, let's say, complex uh, mess that went on in October when we talked about what we thought our vision should be for the future. And you've really done a great job, I think, of capturing the sort of sentiment in the room that that's going in, putting it forward in a way that actually makes it operational. And you know, it, it'll, it should actually allow us to carry out the vision. Thank you. We were supposed to only okay. do five. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were supposed to only do five, but we're, that was uh, a long okay. day. Yeah. That was a long day. Uh, I don't think we need that, because this is going to be, uh, we're going to get final action next month. Uh, did you need any? The action one? would be as enlisted at the top to adopt this set of initiatives we put under the seven, actually formally adopting the seven and adopting the long list of initiatives. Seven strategies. Right. Okay, yeah. we, to approve this, uh, seven <clears throat> strategies. Okay. <clears throat> so move. So moved and second. Uh, second. And, and I'm assuming that will be uh, it, it, back with, 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 with an update changes. next month. Yeah. With, with we're changing. Yeah, that was the motion. Okay. Okay. Uh, anybody? Like yes. To, uh, a comment on item six B, which relates to Pacific Station and it acknowledges the um, known rehab needs, but I believe. Uh, we don't fully understand the long-term needs for rehab, and I would like to also suggest a little bit of wordsmithing there to suggest that there is, is still a choice ahead of us whether to do a rehab or a rebuild. That's rehab versus redevelopment consideration. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Okay, yeah, it's accepted by the maker and second. Yes. Okay, very well. Yeah. Any other comments from the board? Okay, hey, we have a motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Uh, now we go to item number 22, and we'll pass out, as is customary, the uh, the board, uh, the chair 
Uh, as a starting point, recommend some nominees and officers for the 2019 year. Uh, that be uh, and to, these will be finally approved uh, or voted upon in uh, uh, next month's meeting in February. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole list. Uh, I didn't know if the, those who might have specific interests. I did find out from some that they would like to continue on some uh, committees. Uh, I have made some recommendations. Uh, this is, like I said, this is not the vote to accept. That will take place uh, next month. And um, there's a lot on there. We have uh, several committees. And uh, you might just want to take a moment to, to look at them. And if anybody has any uh, recommendations or the, for nominees, uh, I'm very much open to this. I'm, like I'm saying, I'm not, this is not a stamp of approval or what you should do. It's just uh, what I recommend as a starting point uh, to carry on for 2019 under our soon to be distinguished chair, Mr. Bottorf. Um, so uh, if you want, you might want to take a moment to look at that. And if there's anything specific, specific that you'd like to see uh, you or somebody else mentioned in one of these as a possibility, and if not right now, certainly to let uh, our staff know uh, what, what is your interest. And so we can get that out prior to the February meeting. That'd be preferable. Yes, uh, Director Matthews. Do uh, you have a sense of when the uh, additional public member will be appointed? Um, is this going to be, it's going to be in the county. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think well, we, it, we, we posted. We, we posted, did we, did we post it for we Tuesday? Have, uh, I think it's posted uh, on, 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 we posted it on our meeting on uh, on the January 15th. Yeah, and I, January 5th? Yeah, the, oh, our the last trip. meeting we posted yeah. the opening, and uh, so we would normally make an appointment probably in at, at our February 12th meeting. Yeah. Uh, I, right haven't, I haven't checked because I'm not yeah. sure, but, uh, but that's, we usually that's leave it open about right. for Time. Yeah, and so there's some there's some applicants. Well, I don't know. There's, I know there's a few. I think yeah, that have yeah. made application for that. So by the time we would make our final selections, that person would be known and could be should be considered. Correct. Should be enough time, right? Yeah, and we would get that out prior to our next board yeah. meeting too, that, uh, for sure. Yes. I just want to appreciate your work on this. I mean, it's not final until we see what other options might be, but I, I think you've done a really good job of sort of spreading out the work and, and, and nominating people. So thank you for that work. It's not easy, I think, to do that. Yeah, I know. Yes. Um, I just think that we, uh, we can ask staff to make sure that they summarize like, the frequency of the meetings, um, and maybe a little bit about the responsibility of being on that particular um, subcommittee so that they know maybe how much time it may take for that commitment. That might be helpful for some of the Yeah, I think in general, um, these committees usually meet three, maybe four times a year. It's about uh, yes, Mr. Chair, what we ask is that you always block the second Friday of every month out for committees, for all committees. And then as we approach uh, each month, we look at whether we have an agenda or not, we try to let you know as soon as possible that um, we won't be convening a meeting that month, or we will be convening a meeting. But we do ask you going in to block out the second Friday of every morning. And that's typically from as early as uh, 8.30 or 9 in the morning for the first committee through to, I think, as late as 1 o'clock. Uh, 2.30. 2.30, okay. And, and we point out that we used to meet twice a month, and that's why that Friday could be <coughs> free. So we've relieved you of the pressure of two meetings yeah. a month yeah. every month. Yeah. And hopefully there will be people find time to be able to do these committees. And it's, and it's probably three or four times a year that these committees meet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, Director Leopold. Yeah, uh, I, uh, Chair, I think this is a good list to start off with. Uh, I, I noticed with our new members, uh, we want to make sure to include them in, in some of these pieces. And I think it would be great to work with them to figure out where they would like to be. Right. And I appreciate leaving some of this open until we get our full complement of uh, directors. Good. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, I don't see anybody throwing spears at me, so I guess it's pretty much uh, <laughs> successful. It's, uh, yeah, successful. I'll take that. So we'll just that'll be uh, just for your consideration. But please, if you want to uh, be engaged in any committee, let our staff know, and uh, we will carry on and let you know 
Uh, well before, probably two weeks or so before our next board meeting in, in February, so we have a, uh, the, the full component of uh, nominees. Um, okay, now we will uh, review uh, the items to be discussed in closed session through the Sherman or General Counsel, and I guess in general, is there anything that's going to be reportable? Or is there any comments that you need to make? Uh, no comments to make. It's just a labor negotiations conference, and there will not be any report out of closed session. Okay. Very good. And we're now to item 24. The announcement of the next meeting will be at the Capitola City Council Chamber mm -hmm. uh, in Capitola. Um, and so now we will recess into closed session, um, and there's going to be no report on that, so we will adjourn shortly after we close that closed session. Thank you for your attendance. There was some really good news and some good prospects for the future of what's coming to this metro district. We thank everyone for attending. Thank you for community television for televising this uh, meeting. We'll recess into closed session.